Hello. Uh, we're going to dive into chapter 17. And chapter 17 is all about light again. And specifically, it's about the wave-like nature of light. So at the end of the last chapter, uh, we just, I guess it was two chapters ago, we just touched briefly on the photon model of light, where we treated light just exactly as a particle. Uh, now we're going to dive just a little bit more into the wave-like nature of light. And so we've learned now that what is light? It is a wiggling electric and magnetic field. And, okay, let's see what uh, kind of a uh, phenomena that leads to. Okay, so here we go. Uh, wave optics. Here we see this uh, lovely uh, hummingbird. And, you know, the colors on a hummingbird are due not so much uh, to pigments in the feathers, but more um, actually a result of actual structure. So it is the structure of those feathers that produce those beautiful colors. And, and particularly um, some kinds of birds like magpies and uh, hummingbirds and others, they have this iridescent quality where mm, the color might shift depending on the exact angle that you are at. And that is really a result of uh, reflecting off of ridges in the feathers that are very closely spaced. Those ridges are close enough together um, that they're, they're on the same order of size as the wavelength of light. And when light interacts with objects that's about the same size as the wavelength of the light, then we start to see diffraction effects. And there's all kinds of interesting ones. This is not unlike what happens with a, a CD. You guys remember CDs, right? Um, and so if I hold this up here, and if I get the light just right, you really can see a whole rainbow of colors in there, right? Now, this is not reflecting some rainbow that I have in my basement. Um, indeed, it almost looks like an oil slick or something, doesn't it? There's one. It almost looks like you're looking at a puddle of water on the street, and there's oil on the top. Um, and there's a reason for that. It's a similar phenomenon. Um, this is, uh, here we're looking at a diffractive effect. And depending on the angle that you're at here, um, the light combines in different ways. There's a bunch of ridges here, and the light reflects off of each of those ridges. And depending on the angle that you're at, you'll see different colors. Similar to the way that a lot of bird feathers are not actually pigmented, but rather um, it's what we call structural color. It's the actual structure of the feather that gives rise to the coloration. Anyway. That's just an example of diffraction, which is what we're going to be diving into here. So we've been talking about different models of light, and we've talked about some of these, but under some circumstances, light acts like particles. And so we remember that a light particle is called a photon, and it contains a, a discrete amount of energy. Uh, we learned about that a couple chapters ago. In other circumstances, light shows the same kinds of wave-like behavior as sound waves or water waves. And that's really what we're going to be digging into here today. So uh, in this book, or in this, this semester, I should say, we're developing three models of light. There's the wave model, which is what we're talking about here. There's the ray model, which is in the next chapter. And there's the photon model, which we've begun discussing, but which we will go into more depth in towards the end of the semester, if we have time. So let's think about how light waves propagate. And here again, we're treating these waves, we're treating light just like a wave, which it is, in, um, in this model. And so this model is very successful at describing the behavior of waves, um, of describing the behavior of light, um, interacting with all different size of objects. Um, so here we see a picture, and this is a picture of, here we see a picture of um, a wave encountering an opening here. And notice that as it goes through this barrier, it spreads out. And so we see these circular rings. Notice as it's approaching this, this barrier here, it is, a, uh, is these lines of waves, right? Um, and then once it hits this opening, that it turns into these, these hemispheres, these, these circular half circles, I should say, these half circles um, that are propagating out beyond that opening. This is diffraction. 
Like in a nutshell, this picture right here is what diffraction is. It says light waves bend when they encounter a obstacle that is of a similar size as the wavelength of light itself. And so he, this is diffraction. Now, we get some surprising effects when we kind of start digging in a little bit more and seeing what happens, uh, you know, kind of following this to its logical conclusion. We get some surprising results. And, and we need to kind of check in here and say, okay, diffraction is purely a wave-like phenomenon. So if you show me something and it's diffracting, then I say, well, that thing must be a wave. Right? There's, if I throw basketballs through some opening, I just end up with a pile of basketballs on the other side. Right? Particles don't diffract. Waves diffract. And, and we're going to need to keep that in mind as we go moving in towards the, towards the end of this semester. Now, what's the difference between this picture and this picture? Well, in this picture, uh, the opening that the wave is interacting with is much, much larger than the wavelength of light. And so we see these diffraction effects when, again, when light is interacting with objects that are on the same scale as the wavelength of light. And so here we, we don't see, oops, in this slide here, we don't see that diffraction effect, except for right on the very edge. You do see, we see a little bit on the edge, but here in the middle, the waves just move straight forward. And so when light interacts with objects or openings that are much larger than the wavelength of the light, then we don't see these diffractive effects. We see distinct shadows. And that's really more a topic for the next chapter, which is all about the ray model of light. And so we'll talk a little bit about that in the next chapter. So again, diffraction becomes noticeable when the opening is comparable in size with the wavelength of the wave. Now we've been talking a little bit about the speed of light. And so the speed of light is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. That's just super, super fast. And We've maybe at some point in our lives, we've learned that that's some sort of a cosmic speed limit, that, that no physical object or information can travel faster than the speed of light. And that's true. But maybe what you haven't learned is that the speed of light actually varies depending on what substance that light is moving through. So through empty space or through air, it's basically moving at 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. It actually slows down a tiny bit when it comes into air, but not enough to worry about. So in empty space, light moves three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. But when it enters some other medium like water or glass, it slows down. And so we characterize how much it slows down by a quantity that we call the index of refraction. And we use the letter N to represent that. So the speed of light is characterized by an index of refraction, n. And so notice that n is a unitless number, and it is equal to the speed of light in a vacuum divided by a speed of light in some material. And notice that n is always greater than 1, because light does not ever travel faster in any substance than it does in empty space. Um, we're going to find out in the next chapter that this n, this index of refraction, is also related to how much light bends when it moves from one medium to another. You've probably observed that. You've definitely observed it if you have contacts or glasses because you're looking at it right now. Uh, so n can characterize also how much light bends when it moves from one medium to another. But that is the subject for the next chapter, and we will get there. Um, here are some typical values. Uh, you know, again, in, in a vacuum, n is exactly 1. And that's because how fast does light travel in a vacuum? 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. In air, it's extremely close to 1. For the, for the purposes of solving problems in this class, you can just call it 1. Uh, Water is about 1 and a third. So you see that now it's going mm, a bit slower. Right now you see that it's going about 3 fourths the speed in water. That is, light travels about three-fourths the speed in water as it does in air. 
Moving along to glass. Uh, glass uh, light travels about two thirds the speed of light in a vacuum when it's in glass. Now diamond has a very large N. And you know what, this actually is interesting. Uh, this is why diamonds sparkle so much. It turns out that that high index of refraction makes it so that, uh, and, and the way that a diamond is cut also, makes it so that light comes into the top of the diamond, it rattles around in there, and then comes back out the top. It actually reflects around inside the diamond and comes back out the top. Um, this reflection is easier to accomplish with substances with a very high index of refraction. And in fact, um, I hesitate to call diamond a common material, but as far as common materials that, you know, don't just exist in somebody's lab, a diamond is among the highest ends that are out there. There's much, much higher ends that folks have created in the lab. But. So, we see, remember our big money wave equation, that V equals lambda F. And so this V, this is a velocity, equals wavelength times frequency. And we see here that if the frequency is going to stay the same, then as the velocity changes, the wavelength has to change. And in general, the wavelength of the transparent material in the transparent material is shorter than the wavelength in a vacuum. because as the velocity decreases, the wavelength decreases. Um, here's a quick question for you. A light, wave tra light, a light wave travels as a plane wave from air into glass. Which diagram shows the correct wave fronts? So these lines here, uh, we can interpret those as like the peaks of the wave, right? So, you know, our, our, of course our wave is coming in like this. And so we could uh, interpret each of those purple lines there as one of those wave crests. Right. So if we were looking down on this, we might see these wave crests going like this. That's what we're looking at. So which of these shows the correct wave? Why don't you pause the recording and think about it. Okay, so we're back here. Uh, now we see here that as light moves from air into glass, what happens to the velocity? The velocity goes down, the frequency stays the same as we've been discussing, therefore the wavelength has to decrease, A shows the wavelength increasing, B shows the wavelength staying the same, C shows the wavelength decreasing, that is the correct answer. So one of the most famous experiments um, in all of modern physics is the Young's double slit experiment. And we're going to get to revisit this if we get a chance to talk about quantum mechanics a little bit at the end of the semester. Because it turns out to be important for that subject as well. Um, but this is an experiment uh, performed in 1801 first by Thomas Young that confirmed without a doubt that light is definitely, definitely a wave. Why? Because there's no way to explain this experiment except by knowing that light is a wave. That's the only way to explain this experiment. Nobody's thought of any other way to explain this experiment. Maybe somebody did, will someday, I doubt it. But if you see diffraction, you just saw a wave. And so Young's double slit experiment is the classic experiment that proves that light is a wave. Okay, so here's my laser pointer. And if I shine it through, so this is just a laser pointer shining straight at this, this cardboard box. If I shine it through a pair of slits, what do we observe? Well, look, hopefully you can see that. This is, again, I'm shining this light through two narrow slits, right by side each other, right side by side with each other. And what do we see coming out the other side? Do we see two lines like we might expect? No, we don't. We see a very interesting diffraction pattern. Here's the same experiment 
with two slits that have slightly different spacing. Again, this is two slits. Wow, that's pretty cool. You can see that one pretty good, I think. I hope you can. I can see it pretty good. I don't know if you can or not. Woo! Go science! Okay. Okay, so that's the Young's double slit experiment. And it actually, it's very similar to another effect that we saw earlier in the semester, or rather that we heard earlier in the semester. Um, I played you a sound from two sources, and as we walked around the room, we heard quiet, loud, quiet, loud, quiet, loud. And the reason was because of waves interfering. Right? When, I, when I heard it quiet, that was when uh, the sound from one source was out of phase with the sound from the other source. And when I heard a loud spot, that's where the sound wave from one source was in phase with the sound from the other source. Again, waves combining. That's essentially what I've done here. Instead of having actually two speakers or two tuning forks or two separate sources for sound, here we've just taken one incident laser beam and split it into two, and they combine in a very surprising way. One incident laser beam split it into two, and they combine in a very surprising way. Um, here's a little simulation of these uh, two sources of waves combining. And so these are water waves. And we see here that in this line right here, we see destructive interference. This is where the waves are combining out of phase. Here they are in phase. Here they are in phase, out of phase, right? And so along these lines here, we get cancellation. And the amplitude of the overall wave is lower than it would be if there were uh, only one source. Whereas along here we get constructive interference and the waves combine to produce an amplitude that is greater than what it would be from just a single source. Um, and much like what we learned uh, when we were talking about these sound waves, it's the same thing here. It all comes down to path length difference. And so the idea is that the laser light actually travels a slightly different distance from one slit than it does from the other slit. It travels a slightly different distance. Now, we get constructive interference right in the center because they actually travel the same distance. We get a destructive interference band right here because at this point right here, they travel slightly different distances. And in fact, they travel one half of a wavelength different distances. This right here is the M equals three bright spot. This bright spot is formed because the light from this slit travels farther than the light from this slit. How much farther? It turns out three wavelengths farther. Remember, we get constructive interference when the path length difference is zero wavelengths, one wavelength, two wavelength, etc. And we get destructive interference when the path length difference is one half of a wavelength, one and a half, two and a half, three and a half, etc. So what we see here, the central maximum, path length difference of zero. First band, first dark band, I should say, path length difference of one half of a wavelength. First light band, path length difference of one wavelength. One and a half wavelengths different. Two wavelengths different. Two and a half wavelengths different. And three wavelengths difference gives us the M equals three bright spot. Now we can do a little bit of a little bit of math here. Again, here we got our two slits. They're combining at a point over here. I can zoom in on here and we see how much farther does this path go, does this ray travel than this? Well, this little distance right here. And we see here just some quick trig that D is the hypotenuse of this triangle times sine of theta gives us this little segment right here. 
So, in other words, the path length difference depends on this angle that the rays are going to combine at. And so th this gives us a little, a little drawing, and it helps to illustrate some of the terms here. We've got a D, that's the separation between our slits. We've got L, that's the diff distance between the slits and the screen, wherever this, uh, this pattern is showing up. And then here we see we're labeling uh, the distance from the central maximum to the next bright fringe. We're labeling that as Y. So Y is the distance from the central maximum to the first bright fringe. Now, this is our big money or, uh, diffraction equation. And notice it's got some of the things that we saw back when we talked about standing waves, right? These are the mode numbers. Um, and so we get the m equals 0, 1, 2, 3. This refers to the bright spots. Right? And so this is the angle that these bright spots show up at. m is an index telling us which of those we're talking about. And uh, here we see lambda is, of course, the wavelength, and d is our slit separation. Often, we'll use the small angle approximation. The small angle approximation says that sine theta is approximately equal to theta. Um, and this is something that comes in handy. Uh, sometimes students get a little freaked out by it, but it's really not too bad. You know, sine theta looks something like this. Something like that. Um, and notice that if you look at the origin here, and if we drew just y equals x, right? So this would be, my white line here would be like, if this is theta and this is y. And then the orange line is just y equals theta. And so... You can see here that if I'm real close to the origin, these lines actually line up pretty good. And so as long as we're zoomed in on this sort of region right here, then we can very easily just replace sine theta with theta, and it can make a lot of the math easier. So if we do that, we end up with this simpler version, which is y sub m, again, y is the distance in meters, or maybe centimeters, I guess, but the distance in meters from the central maximum. m is which of these I'm talking about, right? m equals 0, 1, 2, 3, which of the bright fringes I'm talking about. l is the length, the distance between my screen, wherever this pattern is showing up, and my double slits. And d is the separation between the slits. Okay, um, this is, uh, I already mentioned this information, but uh, notice that we get dark fringes at the half wavelengths and bright fringes at the full wavelengths. And for this double slit interference pattern, the dark fringes are exactly halfway between the bright fringes. And so if we wanted to, we could write an equation for the dark fringes as well. They are equally spaced. And so here's another equation. It seems like we're getting a lot of equations here, but they're just sort of different versions of this. And notice that we just did m plus a half here, right? So this is replace m with m plus a half, and we get the dark fringes. If we just want to know the difference between these, the separation between them, then we can use this equation right here. Delta y equals lambda l over d. Let's do a couple of examples. A laboratory experiment produces a double slit interference pattern on a screen. The point on the screen marked with a dot is how much further from the left slit than from the right slit. So here's our dot. Here's our central maximum. Um, and we're wondering how much farther is this from the left? than it is from the right. Said another way, we're looking for the path length difference. Why don't you pause the recording and see if you can figure it out. Okay, recall that the central maximum 
is when the path length difference is zero. The m equals one is when the path length difference is one wavelength. And it looks to me like this is the m equals two. And so this must be a path length difference of two wavelengths. Here we are, here's another one. A laboratory experiment produces a double slit interference pattern on a screen. If the screen is moved farther away from the slits, what will happen to the fringes? Why don't you pause the recording and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, so we're gonna move the screen further away from the slits. What's gonna to happen to the spacing of the fringes? Well, this is our, our fringe spacing and the separation between uh, where the slits are and the screen, so in other words, the distance between the slits and the screen, well, that is L. And so we see here that if L increases, so does delta Y. So they should get further apart. Here's another one. Uh, now we have a, a laboratory experiment with red light. It produces a double slit interference pattern on a screen. What if green light is used with everything else the same? What happens to our screen, our fringe spacing? Okay, we're back. Again, our fringe spacing is delta y. Our wavelength is lambda, and green light has a shorter wavelength than red light does. So a shorter wavelength should mean smaller slit spacing. or they'll get closer. Okay, here's a numerical example. Two narrow slits 0 0.04 millimeters apart are illuminated with light from a helium neon laser. This laser has a wavelength of 633 nanometers. What is the angle of the first m equals one bright fringe? And what is the angle of the 30th bright fringe? Well, we could just chug through this. That is our equation that we're going to be working with. And they've asked us for the angle of the first bright fringe. And so we could just solve this for theta, right? Divide through by our d and then take the inverse sine so that theta equals sine inverse of m lambda over d. Well, what is m? It says the first bright fringe, so m is 1, times lambda, that's 630, three nanometers. Over D. And so then we ran our calculator, and we got 0. Point, well, here, I'll write, I'll write out some decimal places. Zero six seven four four degrees. That's degrees. You know, I usually don't keep that many sig figs. Um, I only did that just to say, hey, you know what? This is a really small angle, isn't it? Uh, 0.1 degrees. That's a small angle. You know what? With the small angle approximation, uh, we come up with this. So you can see here that, um, boy, not much difference, right? You got to go way out here 
before you see much difference if we're only at one degree. Um, be careful. Uh, the small angle approximation only works in radians. So if you use the sine theta equals theta business, you got to be in radians. It just doesn't work in angles. So. Okay, so what do we change for B? This was part A. What do we change for B? Well, we're still going to use this equation. We still do this. We still do this, except for now we plug in 30 here for M. And what do we get for part B? Boy, I didn't, I didn't know. Here we go. And now we run our calculator, and we got 28.34. Okay, and just a note, had I tried to use the small angle approximation on this, I would have gotten about 27 degrees. So quite a bit off, certainly off far enough that um, mastering physics is not going to call that a win. Uh, so, you know, we typically say, you know, if you're under 10 degrees, the small angle approximation is pretty effective. Um, I'm not going to ask you subtleties about that exactly, but, uh, you know, just bear in mind which of those equations uh, only work with, this, you know, which of those equations came out of the small angle approximation, and then just kind of keep in mind how big your angle is. Okay.